Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I guess riffing off the topic of kind of rebuilding the commons with the right DNA. Um, hang on one second. I got all I can see is my own face. All right. <clears throat> there we go. Yeah, I put together eight things that I think are pretty crucial if you really do want to build a commons-based organization. I'm going to talk through what each of them is. And I guess I'm going to just start with a little motivational speech, I guess, um, which is just why we should be building these governance structures uh, to be airtight as if our lives depended on it. And um, I kind of contrast the commons from the market. I, I heard um, Michelle say that um, markets are scarcity allocation mechanisms, and they're also systems where most of the resources tend to go to the highest bidders. And so we end up with a kind of a shark eating a shark eating a shark type of economy. And in an economy where, I mean, this is wealth inequality in the US, and I know wealth inequality is not that bad. Um, in Australia, but um, this is what it is in the United States where 20% of the people control 93% of the wealth. And if in a market the resources go to the highest bidders, it means that the top 20% of society is ultimately going to control the resources. And also another motivating thing in the United States is how much this is divided by race. Um, and even in just the last 30 years, um, white households portion or their um, average net worth has grown to be 13 times the average net worth of a black household, African-American household. And so again, if, if resources go to the highest bidders, then we're even dividing our resources along racial lines because of this. So I'm also very motivated by the fact that a lot of resources are owned by people who are of the baby boomer age, meaning they're likely to retire soon, and they're likely to put land up for sale and businesses up for sale. Potentially up to half of farmland in the United States is likely to be sold in the next 20 years. Um, and I, I basically, I picture it just being swallowed up by people who already have a lot of wealth. I think I, I use these little cartoons because that is literally what I see in my head when I imagine what's going to happen if we could sell all these resources in the market. And similarly, all of our small companies, 75% of our small companies are owned by baby boomers. So most of them will either close or be sold. And again, I just picture all of these really vital resources being swallowed up by the people who already have money. And this is extremely motivating. It creates a huge sense of urgency for me. And one of our clients at the Sustainable Economies Law Center uh, basically told us she wants to create a land trust and she said, I want you to create a legal structure that's like a, a sea urchin that has a really tough outer shell to protect the really valuable and important insides and, um, and specifically something that can't be eaten by a shark um, so that that's really protected in the long term. And so, so she wants us to create a common. And, you know, I hear so many different definitions of commons. I've kind of ultimately latched onto one that I find particularly useful, which is just that a commons is something that we create. Uh, so when we take a resource and we decide we're going to manage it in a collective manner, first of all, with a special regard for creating equitable access and stewarding it in the long term. So I kind of break these three things down and I think, how are we going to accomplish that in the legal structures of our organization? Like, what entities are we forming? What do the bylaws say? What are the contractual relationships we're creating with other organizations and people in order to maintain this collective governance, equitable access, and long-term stewardship? So as far as entities are concerned, um, see, a lot of these principles I'm going to talk about are uh, they cross international borders, but pretty much in most countries, as far as I can tell, there are entities um, that are they're cooperative corporations or cooperative associations or they're nonprofit corporations or associations, but these two types of entities, I think, will be the primary container for the commons, because in contrast to a regular for-profit corporation, in these two types of entities, money cannot buy power, so your share of ownership is 
these entities doesn't give you a greater vote. And then similarly, your contribution of capital isn't what buys you profit. It's really your participation in these organizations that is benefiting you, and it's they typically are operated on a democratic basis. And so um, I think these two things are really key uh, as far as like what is the actual legal container of the commons. And you know, again, if, if money buys power and if money buys profit, then you know you can kind of look at where our society is right now and know who's going to ultimately get all of the power and all of the profits. And it's not good. It's really um, disturbing. And so it's you know we almost need to we need to change the rules of the game. We need to change the way we operate now, or things are just going to get much worse very fast. And so this these eight things that I put together are they're not the definitive list. They're kind of just things that I've started to pick up and insights that I've started to gain over the last few years of working with clients who want to build common space organizations. And so I'll talk through what they are. They're, they're different than, I mean, you'll notice there are eight principles. They're different than the eight principles that Eleanor Ostrom laid out. So she looked at common based organizations and resource management systems around the world and she said well these are the eight things that you find to be or that she found to be best practices and contributed to uh, the long-term sustainability of the commons and um, I would say that the things that I'm about to present complement her list or reinforce her list um, but a lot of what I'm going to present really um, a lot of these things really show up in the bylaws or the policies of organization okay so the first one is we need legal structures uh, and mechanisms to just permanently remove these resources from the market. Um, so imagine you have land, a land trust, for example. How do you actually make sure that, that that land will never be sold again on the open and speculative market? Um, and okay, so by the way, this is my attempt at a metaphor today. Um, you know, these eight circles, this is actually a chain. Imagine this is like a chain that we're, we're putting around our commons in order to protect them, sort of. Um, but anyways, I guess one of my, my biggest points here is that if there's a weak link in any of these, that it can really undermine the, the durability and the stability of the commons overall. And so I think this is one where, you know, I know a lot of social entrepreneurs, I know a lot of people who create organizations because they want to do good in the world, but they don't. They don't think far enough into the future to the point where um, they're asking themselves, what happens if someone comes and let's say Uber comes and gives us a huge offer to buy up our software or a big company comes and gives us an offer to buy up this land? How do we actually prevent our organization or ourselves from selling out, basically? So we need to build strong legal mechanisms. Oh, yeah. So if this is the weak link, of course. That's what's going to happen. Another example of what happens when you have a weak link in, in this piece of the chain uh, is what happened to Couchsurfing. So Couchsurfing.com used to be a nonprofit organization a few years ago, uh, you know, and it became a it became a huge phenomenon. Millions of people were participating around the world. It's just astounding to me when I learned that it was actually sold to a for-profit. All of the assets of couch surfing were sold to a for-profit company, coincidentally owned by the founders of couch surfing, for $660,000. Um, I'm, I'm not able to do the um, conversion that quickly, but it's just not very much money. And I think what happened is they, they maybe looked at the software as an asset. And they looked at the profitability of the company, which is not profitable, but profitable because it didn't intend to be profitable. What they didn't take into account was the incredible value of this network they had built and this brand that they had built and just the incredible movement they had created. Um, and none of that was taken into account in the valuation. Um, it was just sold to a for-profit company for what was supposedly a fair market valuation. And immediately investors started coming in valuing the company much higher, tens of billions of dollars. Um, basically, I think this is a tragedy that this happened. So we need to build stronger mechanisms to prevent uh, organizations like this from selling out. 
So what does that look like? Um, as far as the governance provisions of, of, say, our bylaws are concerned, we need to just make it very hard for an organization and its board of directors or whoever controls it, make it very hard for them to decide to sell those assets. Maybe, say, it has to be unanimous uh, if we're going to decide to sell these assets. Or maybe, this is what I usually recommend, give another organization either a veto power um, or a vote on the board of directors so that, let's say, a, a, a nonprofit organization um, saw that another nonprofit saw that Couchsurfing was going to sell off its assets if it had the ability to step in and say, no, you can't do this. Um, I think that would have been good, but people weren't paying enough attention when this happened. Um, and as far as the financial provisions are concerned, just preventing any private individuals from profiting off of the sale, making sure that the proceeds are either distributed to um, nonprofit organizations or other commons-based organizations, or making sure that any individual, any return that they get, get will at least be capped. And by the way, I'll mention that, especially when it comes to land, there are a lot of legal barriers, at least in the United States. I don't know about elsewhere in the world. There are a lot of legal barriers to putting so-called restraints on alienation, meaning you're restraining yourself from selling an asset. And this is actually true of businesses, too. If you, if you create a restraint that prevents you from selling a business or you create a restraint that prevents you from selling land, our legal system generally looks at that with a lot of suspicion because um, our legal system is really supportive of the free market system. And so we have to kind of overcome that by saying, no, there are really solid reasons that we are putting these restraints on. And we could also do some policy work to support this. Okay, second thing, caps on extraction. Um, just caps on how much people can extract their resources or get paid dollars by an organization. What happens if this is the weak link in the organization? Um, I kind of, I think of it as exploitation and excess still can sneak in through the back door of an organization. Even if you're a nonprofit organization or you're a cooperative, you could still have executives who are making excessive compensation. Like in the United States, we have a, a huge consumer cooperative for recreational equipment, REI. And I just can't believe that the CEO is making $3 million. And, um, you know, similarly, you could end up with a situation where you have investors um, buy, say, preferred shares in a cooperative or they lend money at a high interest rate. You could have a situation where investors are taking too much of return and taking away from the commons. And so we need caps on these things. Now, one of the hard things is determining where those caps should be. Um, but as far as, well, some of these slides, by the way, could be a little bit more fleshed out. I just typed in some examples um, uh, in this framework. But yeah, we need to cap salaries, cap returns of investment, um, sorry, returns on investment, um, cap how much we're allowed to gain from the sale of real estate, um, and just culturally, I think a lot of these things are reinforced by, by culture and our social expectations. And we really need to kind of end this expectation that, that you can maximize gain from anything um, or that if you own property, you're entitled to maximize the value from it. Um, I just kind of want to create a culture where that's, um, that's um, not a positive attitude anymore, basically. I'll give you an example um, with regard to worker cooperatives. I actually, you know, I was thinking about are worker cooperatives inherently commons-based organizations under that definition I used, which includes long-term stewardship. And I actually think if you really want to incorporate long-term stewardship into a worker cooperative, sort of imagining, okay, the business itself is the resource. Uh, the beneficiaries are the workers. The business is creating jobs for them. If you want to really operate that as a commons, here's another way to do it, uh, is to actually cap the compensation to workers at some point. Preferably, they'll still make a really decent livelihood. I'm not talking about capping it at you know, just living wage necessarily, but capping it at some point. And then any surpluses that are generated after that have to be used to create new jobs. And in that way, what you're doing is you're creating a commons that 
it benefits current workers and it benefits future workers by putting a cap on the wages that can be extracted. But this is this is a huge challenge that we have. I mean, um, in helping structure organizations to have caps like this, is where do you set them? Um, are there indexes you can use? Um, what do you should you use market rates by industry for setting salaries? And, um, how do you set returns on investment? And it's hard to find objective measures that feel perfect so far. And by the way, since I know that intrinsic motivation is one of the questions that Open Food Network is, is grappling with, I thought it might be worth mentioning or at least asking the question of whether um, caps on salaries can actually reinforce intrinsic, mo intrinsic motivation because if you set a salary at a point where people are earning enough to make their livelihoods, but capping it there, then any work that people do for the organization, um, they, they're they doing it not because it's going to make them wealthier, they're doing it because it's going to make a, a better world or a better organization or a better commons. And so I think there's something very powerful um, sort of psychologically also about capping people's ability to extract. Third thing um, is something I'm calling worker trusteeship. And this is the phrase that I invented. And you know, one of the things I'm actually trying to do right now is invent more phrases that can become part of our vocabulary on an international level so that we can have kind of a lexicon of commons-based legal structures that we could all talk about together. And sometimes, you know, giving something a name makes it a lot more real, even when it doesn't have, you know, even when it doesn't exist yet. Um, it, it just makes it a lot more tangible and feels more possible, I guess. So worker trusteeship, I wanted to create a slide about it. I didn't actually have time. But trusteeship is just a concept that I think a lot about and I feel very passionate about because it's basically the idea that a trustee is a person who's holding a resource for the benefit of either society or for the benefit of a group of people or beneficiaries. And that trustee is not operating to maximize their gain. Trustees traditionally under US law are allowed only reasonable compensation. And what is reasonable, that's always a question. But, uh, but they have to be highly transparent. They have to provide a lot of accounting, a lot of accounting to the beneficiaries. They have to make sure that the resource is not diminished and generally make decisions in the best interest of preserving that asset for the beneficiaries. And so, Worker trusteeship means that all of the workers in an organization see themselves as trustees. And I think this is, it becomes more and more important as we grow organizations with broad stakeholder groups. Um, well, for a variety of reasons, actually. Let me, I have, I have a few more slides sort of explaining why I think it's important. But if, if we have organizations that don't treat the workers as if they are trustees of the organization, um, here's sort of the weak link, here's what could happen, um, is we end up with boards of directors, and traditionally cooperatives and nonprofits have boards of directors, that are volunteers, they maybe meet quarterly, and I started to think of it as kind of a flyover governance, um, where a board of directors really has a hard time being directly accountable to members and stakeholders on a daily basis. But if you have the workers see themselves as the trustees, they can be accountable on a daily basis, and they can be accountable to a broad stakeholder group. Um, but another reason is if you have trustees who are working for the organization full time, you can create better feedback loops, and you probably also create happier workers. And I, um, I'm always trying to come up with metaphors. Here's another one. Um, this is a mountain that let's imagine this is a nonprofit organization where the workers are trying to sort of carve out a pathway to the to a better world you know they're the ones on the ground doing the work kind of surveying the terrain and figuring out what are the best pathways to achieving this mission a board of directors again they're kind of like up there at 50,000 feet maybe providing guidance and oversight but if they are the ones who are telling the workers exactly what to do we, we create these hierarchies with level management and the feedback loops become really long. So you have um, ideas potentially coming from the workers up to mid-level management, which uh, or the CEO that communicates with the board, and the board makes decisions and tells management what to do. And um, it just makes it very hard to be really responsive and sensitive to the needs of 
community and to stakeholders. And so I guess just something I've been hearing myself say a lot lately is that I, I'm starting to feel like we want to build highly participatory governance structures, highly accountable to everybody. Um, but I think boards of directors are becoming an archaic concept. Uh, but of course, it does still bring. Oh, there goes my animation. Um, anyway, it, sorry. Um, it still brings up the question of what is the role of the board of directors, and I think the role of the board of directors then becomes more one of oversight and guardianship. Uh, they're sort of creating a process wherein workers are acting as trustees. Um, and the board of directors is just kind of like a check and balance for ins ensuring that that is working properly. And by the way, I, in case you know, just in case you saw this, I skipped by it, but yeah, I, I created these slides just to kind of show how slow and clunky hierarchy can be in organizations when you have to create all these layers of management. Um, I think that we we could just create much more agile organizations through worker trusteeship. And by the way, if we can come up with something better than worker trusteeship, I'm, I'm struggling. Sometimes we call it worker self-governance, worker self-directed organizations. I'm not sure, but, but one thing that's true of trustees typically is that if you have a trust with multiple trustees, generally the trustees have equal power. And the reason is because they have such a heightened level of responsibility, perhaps they should have um, heightened power and also equal power. Um, and so my organization, Sustainable Economies Law Center, we use holacracy primarily as our governance model. Um, we actually all make the same salaries. And we're, I see this as a way to kind of empower everyone in our organization as a leader who can be responsive to the needs of, of our community and of social change, propose projects, carry them out. Um, because we're, we, we see all of ourselves as trustees of the mission. And it's not just, you know, my title happens to be executive director because people think nonprofits need executive directors. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I'm making the decisions. It means that we are all doing it together. And we did actually a whole webinar on being a worker self-directed nonprofit. So I'll stop there on, on that topic. Just a really short shout out, I guess, for this link in the chain, which is that it any commons-based organization, I think, has to be sustainable for the workers uh, in the sense of enabling them to make livelihoods and living wages. And I don't have a lot else to say other than that, but I do think that that can be a huge weak link in any commons system. Um, because at the end of the day, the resources are, for the most part, being created or managed by workers. And if the workers are not able to sustain themselves or if they're not happy, uh, then I think the whole system will crumble. Um, and by the way, I was looking at Open Food Network's uh, website because the question in my mind was, okay, which stakeholder group do they really see themselves serving? Could it be the eaters of food? Could it be, um, well, I guess the eaters of food, workers on farms, whatever it might be. But I, I think, yeah, the producers slash workers um, really making them central uh, is important. I mean, obviously people need to eat food and it's important that we create systems to enable us to all eat good food. But if at the end of the day it's not working for the producers and the farmers, then, uh, then we have a problem. So. Okay, creating a chain of commons. I'm sure I could have said this in a better way, but here's what I mean. Um, or here's what I mean if we don't create a chain of commons. I'm using a quick example of Asakia in the United States. These are irrigation canals in the southwest of the U.S. that um, have been around for many hundreds of years that are used to irrigate farms, and they're managed democratically by the farmers. And throughout time, though, they've started to degrade. So this is an example of a commons that was not uh, built in relation to other commons. So basically what, what they had was a system where they would um, elect somebody to manage the flow of resources and the access to water. But over time, you know, farmers, kids went off to business school and they came back and they were like, hey, mom and dad, let's start buying up some land. And then if we own more land, we'll make more money. And so you ended up 
uh, what we ended up with is, is landowners owning a lot of the land and then therefore demanding more power in the decisions about how water is managed and also just treating water as a, a commodity that could even be sold for industrial purposes and it creates a problem for the decision making system for this commons uh, which is whereas whereas they used to allocate water based on what felt fair and what felt fair was in relation to um, how well people can make their livelihoods uh, the goal was just to make sure that everyone will survive and have enough um, whereas now it's become a really kind of um, uh, difficult system and you know fairness has kind of gone out the window and it's really about who has more leverage and who has more money and so um, yeah it's become kind of uh, I guess people have started dropping out of the participation in governance. It's really not about social relations anymore. And so but what I'm trying to say, <laughs> and not saying it very succinctly, is the problem was that we didn't manage the land as commons. We were managing water as commons, but the land itself was not being managed to ensure that everybody has access to enough land. We were allowing it to be sold on the open market. And then similarly, the labor on the land uh, was not being managed as a common, that we weren't managing work opportunities to make sure that there was enough for everyone. And so I really think in order to sustain a water commons, we have to have a land common. And probably even you could be thinking about the workers on the land um, and that they aren't being exploited as well. Well, let me give another example. I'm not doing a great job of explaining this, but um, hmm, mainly because I'm, I'm realizing I'm going to run out of time soon. By the way, this is a quote from David Bollier that I like, which is just that commons can have uh, as much, they need to have as much autonomy and integrity of purpose as possible. And even if we're interacting with markets, we really have to resist enclosure and resist that lust for capital accumulation. And I think what it means is that we need to kind of build commons that create more commons, that interact with commons and transact with commons. And when we have weak leaks in the chain, um, we have to do something about it. And I'll say what that is in a moment, although Michelle kind of has a solution uh, already. But, but I guess one of the questions is, how do commons even interact with other commons? We're creating usually contractual relationships. We might be licensing software. We might be leasing land. Um, and it is through these contractual relationships that we can structure um, a system that incentivizes the creation of more commons or that requires that participants in the commons be managing their own enterprises as commons. Um, but yeah, there's Open Food Network. I just took this off their website. They're creating regional platforms around the world. So I'm kind of just hypothetical. I've created a chain for Open Food Network. There's an Australian regional Open Food Network emerging. Like, what if there was a US regional? Uh, company. Let's say it was a for-profit company that said, all right, you license the software for us, we'll reprogram it to work in the U.S., and then we'll license it for a fee to, uh, or, yeah, license it to a fee to organizations. Like, that becomes a weak, weak link in the chain um, uh, where there's potential extraction um, or it could start to compete unfairly with, with other users of the software. Um, at, the, at the regional level, let's say that the Australia Regional um, Open Food Network created a Brisbane food hub that, again, is operating like a for-profit organization, um, you know, basically taking a fee from every food producer who's using the software uh, and using the hub to market their products. Again, that's a weak link in the chain. I think one of the things I really like uh, when I was reading about Open Food Network is the fact that every, all of these regions and all the organizations they're partnering with so far are nonprofit organizations or the equivalent, and I think that's really good. Um, uh, similarly, you know, the I guess this is a question. This is probably a question that I, I'm guessing the Open Food Network, um, or I would love to hear any thoughts about if the Open Food Network has dealt with this, is what if the people selling their products through that food hub using the software are big corporate farms that are profiting, profiting off of low-wage labor? Um, is that a weak link in the chain? And if so, what do we do about it? I think it is actually a weak link in the chain. These corporate farms can you know, exploit labor, 
get an unfair advantage in the marketplace, push out competition. Um, but how do we interact with them? Even if they're, you know, let's say we're still going to interact with them. Well, this is where I think things like the common space reciprocity licenses make a lot of sense. It's saying if you're going to license this uh, to a for-profit, you know, have them pay something back into the commons. And so it's like saying, okay, we have a weak link here, but we are going to reinforce it by entering into a license that requires it to pay back to the commons. So I think that is a solution especially because we have a lot of for-profit entities that we're interacting with. Um, similarly, okay, this is my, my dream is to have an agricultural land trust that leases land, leases land to jobs cooperatives, you know, those worker cooperatives that create new jobs. But if those jobs cooperatives ever convert to a regular old for-profit company, then the lease agreement would say, okay, now that you're not a jobs cooperative anymore, you need to pay a larger fee back into the commons, back into the land trust. So yeah, this is reinforcing those weak links. Um, okay. Another key piece of the puzzle, key link in the chain, uh, is polycentric governance. And the word polycentric, I, I tend to sort of translate from English into English by saying it means creating many centers of power in an organization. So as opposed to that hierarchy that I had before where the power is kind of centered uh, in one place, it's sort of trying to push the power and push the decision making out as close as possible to the people who are affected by the decision. And so we end up creating organizations and organizational relationships that are kind of like fractals. Um, and I guess there may be two two major region, reasons why I think polycentric governance is really key. Because for a while I was thinking, is polycentric governance key to creating a commons? And I wasn't sure. But you know, when I look at what Eleanor Ostrom writes about what are the best practices in creating durable, stable commons, most of the things that she says actually do rely on pushing power down to the, the sort of ground level. Like if you're going to monitor resource extraction and enforce rules around it and create rules that are adapted to those local conditions, it's really all best done at the local level. If you want people to be participating in governance, creating a lot of centers of power makes that possible. Um, and also generally maintaining the diversity, cultural diversity of all the people participating in this commons. Like the more centers of power you create, the more you can sustain that diversity. The other thing, the other reason I really like polycentric governance is that I kind of feel like our ice caps are melting and uh, wealth inequality is just out of control. And if we don't build commons now, we're uh, going to be in bad shape. And so I, I also like organizational structures that are designed to rapidly spread. And so you create an organization that's basically like the scaffolding um, on which or around which people can build other things, it accelerates the growth and the spread of commons. So as far as what does that look like in the legal structure, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm trying to figure out how do you start a new organization and actually mandate in its bylaws that it create polycentric structures as it grows. Um, still a question in my mind about what that looks like, because it's kind of hard to predict how an organization is going to grow and where those centers of power will emerge and what the basic bare bones scaffolding of them needs to be. Um, and by the way, I think technology makes this much more possible than I think it ever was before. Things like Lumio, um, whatever it might be, GitHub, um, enable a lot of participatory governance at a in a lot of places, and partially because everything becomes a lot more transparent. Okay, number seven in the chain. Um, so equitable allocation of resources. Maybe I don't have a lot to say about that other than um, it gets, it gets back to this problem of interacting with markets is that when you're interacting with markets and when you're interacting with individuals and businesses who are trying to maximize their gain, the whole concept of equitable kind of gets really skewed. It's like, what is equal in a society where people can just accumulate forever? It's, it's really hard to even answer that question. Um, and so what does equitable mean? I actually, you know, I really don't know far as what does it mean for people's livelihoods and what is the concept of enough. And, um, but I think it's key and it's something we need to really 
struggle with. And, and kind of related to that is this final element of being restorative. And again, this might not be the best word, but kind of looking at the context that we're operating in now where ecosystems and resources are really damaged and they've also been enclosed quite a bit and wealth inequality and racial inequality are um, so such huge problems. I feel like we cannot create durable commons. Like we can kind of create an insular organization to provide for ourselves, like the housing cooperative or a renewable energy cooperative. But if we're not looking outward, if we don't have an outward facing view, thinking about restoring the balance in society and on the planet as a whole, it's just going to undermine what we're doing ultimately. I think the whole thing will ultimately come crumbling down. And so I was trying to figure out, do commons inherently have to have an outward facing perspective? I'm not sure, but I know that in the context of the current world we're living in, if they don't, I don't think anything's really going to be sustained in the long run. So, so I feel like it has to be a part, it has to be a link in the chain. Or, yeah. Um, yeah. I can never pull these slides up enough. I kind of feel like we have to be constantly reminded of, of wealth inequality. And, but anyways, um, my last slide is just pretty uninspiring. I just wanted to call attention to two things. Those are kind of legal issues. One is knowing Open Food Network's a charity, knowing that a lot of land trusts tend to be charitable organizations. Charitable organizations have a kind of narrow scope of activities. And I do think that that could actually become a problem as we're you know, trying to create organizations that provide for us as people, where charities are considered to be organizations that provide for them, them, the people who are disadvantaged struggling and kind of an interesting balance and I think what we just need to do is create policy incentives that that well create tax incentives for organizations that are building commons as much as we do create tax incentives for charities uh, and then finally international enforcement okay that's a big one but I guess one of the key pieces of the puzzle is we're creating international commons and we want regions and local commons to kind of all have a mutual agreement, so the basic agreement of how we're working together, or we have licenses that need to be enforced, or leases that need to be enforced. How do we do that when we have so many different laws and court systems around the world? And I think, I guess two questions are in my mind. One is, do we need an international commons arbitration organization? This might be kind of like one of the key uh, pieces of the commons ecosystem, kind of like, um, you know, I was hearing Michelle talk a lot about new organizations that are emerging like the Collaborative Technology Alliance and the Ethical Entrepreneur Coalition, some sort of commons-based arbitration coalition and that kind of binds these organizations to um, negotiating with each other and resolving their disputes outside of our uh, local court systems. And I guess another question I still have in my mind because I'm not sure I fully understand blockchains yet. I've been trying, really been trying, but the extent to which um, blockchain or contracts built on blockchain um, technology uh, could kind of be self-enforcing. And that, yeah, that is just still a question I haven't been able to wrap my mind around. But, but I'm going to stop there. I think I've been talking.